<laughs> I was wondering where I was. <laughs> Yeah, that's where I do. But anyway, I, I'm going to introduce you quickly. The company on top is Jill. She will be your company for you. Okay. And I'm the body and Kelsey, who will be your company for me. That makes me the best selling author, Nasty Nagel. Oh, thank you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> All right. Thank you for the time and making it figure out the time and it's got you to come on my podcast. The, the, the Cash Share podcast. I'm really happy to have you on the episode for today. Thank you. I've been excited to come on Cat Chat. <laughs> it just sounds fun right from the get go. <laughs> yeah, definitely. First off, um, we're going to do a quick run through about uh, the earlier book. Like Christmas in Evergreen, Letter to Santa, Ballad of Ringing, and a couple of other ones to uh, adapt um, into Hallmark. So, how to, before about that, how did you think about becoming a writer? What inspires you? Okay. All right. So, you ready to start now? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, let's start with what inspired me to be a writer. You know, I was a career girl. I worked as a senior vice president with Bank of America for over 20 years, and I loved my career. I was one of those crazy 60 hour work week girls. And the year that I turned 40, my job was to ship technology positions offshore. And it was a really good business case. I understood it, but it broke my heart. So many of those technicians had worked for me over the years. I knew how good they were at their job. And here they were being laid off and, and their jobs being replaced. So it was just a really heartbreaking time for me. And I was really struggling with kind of how to, how to level the scales. You know, I felt so bad, but I, you know, I had done a good job. I did what I was supposed to do, but personally, um, it was a struggle. And so, you know, I had always been a voracious reader. And when things went bad in my life, exactly every single time I would grab a book. <laughs> so when that was going on, of course, I was grabbing books and reading and trying to make myself feel better. And I went, oh, if I could write a book to help one girl through one bad day, that would be amazing. And so that was the only reason that I ever even tried to write a book. I had no idea how hard it was to get published, how long it took to write mm -hmm. a book. <laughs> Tell me about it. Short. I'm in the middle of writing a children's book. Don't I know. Yes, exactly. So, um, yeah, so over the next nine years, um, I was writing on vacations and I did a lot of travel in my position at the bank. And that was back in the days when U.S. Airways, you could open your laptop and actually work. Now they have the seats so close, you can barely do that. <laughs> but yeah. I would write on the airplane and it took me about nine years to get my very first book published. And it was called Sweet Tea and Secrets. And it was a sweet small town story and it had a little bit of a suspense storyline to it too. And um, that first book was a three book deal. So I was excited, but I still was thinking of it only as this kind of, wow, it would be nice to help one girl through one bad day thing. I still wasn't thinking that it was going to be a career path. And so I wrote those three books and then I got another three book deal. And then 2014 rolled around and I lost my husband to a short battle with cancer. And when I lost him, I knew uh, that my life was shifting and I decided that I wanted to step away from my corporate position and concentrate on writing and spreading joy. And so that's all I do now. I, I just write books. I just try to uplift others. Um, the Shell Collector is the book of my heart. You've got it. It's my fourth time reading it. I'm like halfway. I'm like looking back. I'm just, I'm just like, oh, hurry up. It's well, I need to get nifty about that. That, oh my gosh, you know, God's hands are all over that story. I love that story. And it, and it took me a while to write it. Um, it was, I guess, about four years after I had lost Mike 
that I started writing that book. And, um, you know, it's navigating, it's a story about navigating loss and, and, and navigating grief to hope and happiness. And, you know, I think it's probably the most important book I'll ever write in my entire life. And the number of other widows that I've had come in contact with ever since then has been amazing. And we cry together and we uplift each other and remind each other there's going to be another good day ahead. And um, I, I, I think that was the whole purpose of all of it, you know? <laughs> definitely, so definitely. I mean, I, after the reading book, a couple of the books and then how they turn into Hallmark, I went like, ah. I'm looking at something right. here. I was like, that yes. author is familiar. I'm not looking up. I'm like, oh, I read her books and now it's a movie. Interesting. I mean, I love the book. Of course, I am a bookworm. I read <laughs> books all the time. Like if I have a lunch break at work or I yes. don't have donuts or they don't need my help, I'm reading. I'm That's reading. Yeah. I'm reading. I buy books off of Amazon or go to Walmart. My husband, I like, keep walking. I'm like, why? But there's books over there. I was like, oh, I need to get another oh, no. book. He's like, no, you don't. You have like 20 books on your to be read shelf. Finish those, burn. I'm like, okay. <laughs> 20 books down the hall. He was like, keep walking. Okay. Okay. Well, you know, it was such a blessing. Um, it, it was the year after I had lost Mike. Um, and you know, I was kind of getting back on my feet a little at that point. And I had written the story Christmas Joy. Um, it ha was not out yet. I had written it. And with traditional publishing, sometimes it takes six, nine months before you ever see any notes back from your publisher on it. And it's because it's not going to come out for another year, year and a half. So my publisher had it, but we hadn't discussed it or talked about what in what good shape it was or anything. And um, my agent gave me a call and said that Crown Media, Hallmark, was interested in Christmas Joy. And so we were so excited, but of course it hadn't been edited yet. So my agent got us together and we, for 30 days, quickly ran through it, got it all pretty and sent it out. And then for about six months, there was nothing. You know, we didn't hear anything back and we we're okay. So the book was set to come out um, that following winter and it did, it came out. And then on Valentine's Day, the year after it came out, my agent called and it was like 630. It was beautiful weather. I was living in North Carolina at the time and I was on the patio and we were cooking out on the grill and my phone rings on Valentine's Day and it's my agent. So I answer it. And she said, Nancy, I would never, ever call you on Valentine's night, but I think I've got news you're going to want to hear. Okay. And she said, they are putting your movie into production. And so one week later from that date, I flew out to Vancouver and was on set to watch them make the film Christmas Joy. And it was amazing. I cried almost the whole entire time. <laughs> Remind me who, in, I'm trying to remember, there's so many Christmas in Evergreen or Christmas, the Christmas Joy. Yeah, so Christmas Story was the one where Aunt, Ru Aunt Ruby falls off the ladder and hurts her ankle and ends up in the hospital. And so Joy comes from yeah. the D.C. area, yep, to help with Ben um, with the Christmas cookie crawl. And um, such a fun story. And um, I, I mean, I was so excited. But here's the funny thing. And this is what I love about the books versus the movies is in the book, it's a you know, Southern country farmhouse. Now, I don't know about everybody else, but in my mind, that's a two-story white house with the long hang overhang porch, might or might not have a little barn out back. So I get to Vancouver and they have a driver come and get me and they're going to take me on set. So we drive and we drive and I've been to Vancouver in the city, but never out into Maple Ridge into the, you know, pretty suburban rural areas and stuff so it was beautiful there were blueberry farms it was right up my alley and then and he pulls into this driveway and we come around and it is this humongous log home and I even hate, I hate to call it home because it had wings I mean it was huge <laughs> and I was like oh Ruby has gotten 
a, a raise here. <laughs> She's got a really big improvement. <laughs> and then on that property, they had another smaller cabin and it was like in the shape of like a chalet. And at the end of the story, that's where they're shooting that scene where they're standing and looking up at the sky. And that's that chalet. That's another part of the property. And so they use like the kitchen for the baking and all that stuff in that big front house and then other pieces for the living room. And so they kind of make it into this whole new place by taking shots from different angles. Uh, but it was so exciting. And at one point um, I was sitting in what they call video village, which is, you know, a 10 by 10 black tent and it has the cameras in it or the, the monitors, not the cameras. And the director is sitting in there and she's watching them start to shoot the scene. And I had no idea what they were going to shoot or anything. It was my favorite scene of the whole book. Like, what are the odds that that would happen? And it was the scene where Joy and Ben are both sitting in the living room and they're talking about the ornaments. And she's got that green ornament that her mama had given her all those years ago. And it breaks. And I just cried. And the producer came over and said, oh. are you okay? And I was like, yes. And she said, do you like it? I said, I love it. And she said, well, then you can cry all you want. <laughs> that's amazing. That's and amazing. Do. Yeah. I've always wanted to hear from an author's perspective when the book are being made into movies because not everything could be the same. No. So well, and it's when I was reading Dan Dyer Combe, it was more oh. like, um, like a, a revolt. And the story or the actor, the one I'm reading, I'm like, wait a minute, that's not what happened in the movie. She met this, this other guy, not this guy. But wait a minute, it's the book. Maybe yeah. the movie that everything changed, but yeah. I the really enjoyed staying on the hallmark thing. adaptation from your book into a movie. But oh, the book is better, but the movie can be good too at well yeah. with a different yeah. storyline. On the put angle, put back yes. to face on the production team and collaborating with the author. Yeah, well, and they don't collaborate with us. They do it totally separate from us. Um, so I didn't have any input. And it's interesting because like on Christmas Joy, my first time ever, I really didn't have an idea of how much would be left out. That was kind of news to me. So when I got there, being a Southern girl, I had all these presents, you know, with all this stuff from North Carolina and um, to give everybody. And so I had like for all the people in the movie and all. And so there was this one special bag that was a little bunny rabbit because in the book, you'll, you might remember there's this little bunny rabbit hand painted lunch bag that Molly, the little girl carries. So I've got this little lunch bag that's been hand painted and I'm giving all the other stuff out. And I'm like, where's Molly? <laughs> and they're like, Molly? It's like, yes, the little girl in the movie, is she getting tutored or is she just not filming today? And they was like, oh, there are no children in this movie. I was like, oh, okay. So that was my first realization, you know, that important people that were in the book were going to be missing. So it did make all the other movies a little easier for me to understand you know, how that was going to work. And um, the interesting thing was, so um, Christmas Joy and Hope at Christmas both came out the same year. And I had gone to both of those sets. And so I really got a pretty good education of how they can't fit a whole book into a movie. But here's my philosophy. I set out to write a story that is going to bring joy to someone. It's going to make them feel uplifted and happy. And if it's different in the movie, but it still does those same three things, I'm fine. That is just fine. Because that's all I set out to do anyway. Right. And so I am fine with that. Um, but then um, right after Hope at Christmas became a movie is when uh, Crown Media contacted me because we'd done that work together and said, hey, we've got these new Hallmark original movies coming out. We'd like for you to write the books. And so that's when I wrote Christmas in Evergreen and Christmas and Evergreen Letters to Santa, and then Tidings of Joy. So that was completely different because the movies were already made. And I thought it was going to be super easy. They were like, Nancy, we're going to give you the screenplay. We're going to give you the movie. Yeah, it's sure, no problem to watch the movie like, and make a book out of it. So 
I get, I'm like, okay, you know, and uh, so they send everything finally, and I only had like 45 days to write it, but I'm thinking, well, it's gonna be a piece of cake, right? They made it sound so easy, and um, I start getting to work, and I thought, well, the first thing I'll do is just take that screenplay, and I'll just turn it into dialogue, right? What are you doing? Oh my gosh, when I turned that stuff into dialogue, there was only 20,000 words there, 20,000, and I needed about 65,000. <laughs> That's a lot of stuff. So yeah. it was a lot. And, and what I found as I watched the movie 150 times, right, to try to get it all down, was that, you know, in my stories, I I love my towns. They're like another character. And I try to give you lots of explanations, but I also try to leave a little bit of wiggle room so that you insert your memories into it and kind of make it your own, right? Well, in this case, everybody had seen it. Everybody had seen every sparkly light and every red snowman hat and all that stuff. And I had to recreate it for people who had already experienced it. So it was, it was a lot of pressure. I was nervous when I wrote the first one. And the first one, they didn't let me change anything. It had to be exactly like the movie. And the, the problem with that is that dialogue in a movie is really comfortable conversation. But when you're writing it a book, it doesn't always come out very nicely you know and so by the time I got to the second book they were like okay you can tweak it you can, you can do what you need to do they trusted me by then <laughs> oh my goodness that might be difficult Make it was a book exactly like the movie I'm amazed I'm amazed I'm gonna have to read that book again and just to see. see how good I did you sent hey, me a note the movie <laughs> I loved, love, love being the voice of Evergreen. You know, so when I first took that that job, um, because they basically just hired me to be their writer, um, I they couldn't even tell me what the movie was. All I knew was that it was going to be a new original movie and that I was going to write the book. So they were, I thought I was going to see the movie before I had to start writing it. I never did. I didn't see it until everybody else saw it. So I'm watching it with the whole world, right? And I'm, I'm seeing this movie and I'm like, oh my gosh, this movie is like perfect for me. It's on a farm and there are goats in it. You know, my late husband was a goat farmer. He was a shepherd. So I knew so many things and that the little cow, the baby calf was in there. And so there was a lot of stuff that was just so close to my heart that it was such a good fit. And I love being the voice of Evergreen. I loved, I still go and do signings at the Hallmark stores out here in the South um, and sign those books. And I, I just love, love, love it. <laughs> oh, that took me, but I lived in a town. I wouldn't made a trip there, but I live in Wisconsin. <laughs> I love Wisconsin. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. The great place to raise the family. We moved around. I went to college in Washington, D.C. Met my husband there. Lived there. Then we moved to Wisconsin for a short time. Then we moved to Mississippi because of my career for about five years. And then right. we decided we want to move back to Wisconsin because that's where we want to raise the family, two children. So we've been into Wisconsin ever since. Oh my gosh. Well, I used to do a, a book signing in Milwaukee every year. We used to have this Barbara Bay Reader event and they since quit doing that. But this year I do a small town event um, down in Galena, Illinois, and you can't fly there. So I'm flying into Madison and then I'm going to go stay in the Dells for a week. And I've never been there. So I'm really excited. <laughs> It's very nice. It's very nice. Very nice. Yeah. Maddie's standing up. It's really nice. Good. I hope it gives me some book ideas. <laughs> yeah. Um, out of all of these Christmas and Evergreen, that is the Santa, by the ringing, the secret ingredient, the uh -huh. Santa dollar home. Yes. They're all adapted into her mouth. I really enjoyed all of them. Because I read all of the books and I've seen <laughs> all of the movies. I really <laughs> like how they, they incorporated the secret ingredient, but for some reason that was just very interesting. And the chemistry was like being on the cook show and then trying not to reveal the identity or yes. the purpose 
a beady and a ditty, and I'm reading the book, and I'm like picturing the movie <laughs> in my mind. I'm just like, wow. They did such a great job. That really is my favorite one. The funny thing about The Secret Ingredient is when I was on set for Christmas Joy, I met with some girls from Crown Media and we had lunch and we were just talking and giggling and they were showing me pictures on their telephone of like Happy the dog and Happy the cat, you know, the Hallmark animals. And in those pictures, there was a picture of a little baby pig and they were kissing on it. And I was in hysterics. I was like, I cannot believe y'all were kissing on a pig in a New York City high rise office building. And so I said to them at lunch that day, the next book I write, I'm going to have a woman who has a micro pig as a pet and she's going to march him down Main Street and it's going to be just for y'all. So that was this book. So when they didn't put the pig in the movie, I was like, what? (laughs) Y'all inspired it. (laughs) Yeah, it would be so cool. Mike won't pay care about it. You don't say you like legally blind with a little chihuahua. And so it was funny because, you know, in the, in the book, she gets the little pig after they break up. Um, after Andrew leaves and she names it Gray for good riddance Andrew York and um, so in in the movie they have a dog and he's named George and I'm like well why didn't you at least keep the name Gray and they said well that's just too mean and I said oh you you have no idea what we girls do when a boy breaks up with us we cut their faces out of pictures we tear up their shirts (laughs) naming a pig was a nice thing Um, the next question is the last question that we're going to talk about the child collector. Okay. Um, obviously, I'm pretty sure the child collector answered the question. Any of these books based on life experience or life changing moment, or did you put down a little piece of your life background or stories into a book? Yeah, so there's always a little teeny bit of your background. I mean, I don't know what authors can can get away with not writing anything from their background. Now, the secret ingredient, having the kind of mishmash of kind of the Hallmark feel, but the cooking, the Food Network, my mama and I binge watch Food Network cooking competitions all the time. We love them. So that was kind of why I thought, oh, this would be so fun to have this cooking competition and then be trying to beat each other on this uh, the secret competition and have the same recipe. So it came from out of our love for that. And that's, you know, my mama lives with me now. And so just, you know, something that was familiar and fun. And I hoped to kind of import and impart that um, that joy into other people. Um, on the other ones, you know, other than just my love for Christmas and um, and happiness, I wouldn't say any of those ones had any real significant events. I'm trying to think. Um, nope, not any of those. Some of some of the books I write do, and, and like you mentioned, the Shell Collector, absolutely. You know. Um, the Shell Collector, which is streaming on Fox Nation, um, it came out of you know me navigating my grief, but it also came out of my cousin Diane um, was younger than me, and she had been fighting breast cancer for years, and she had once told me a story about someone that a friend of our family that lived out in Kitty Hawk, in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, and she had been walking the beach like she did all the time, and she had something heavy on her heart. And as she walked, she kicked up a shell. And when she picked up the shell, it had a scripture in it. And it was just the right thing that she needed to hear that day. And she found a few more over the years and nobody else that she knew had ever found any. Nobody knew who might've written them, nothing. So Diane had told me that story. Well, five weeks from the day that I lost Mike, I lost Diane. And I remembered thinking, Oh my. I use a bucket of those yeah. shells right now. And that's when that story of the shell collector and someone placing those messages out there to the world and then finding their way to someone at just the right time started coming to be. Um, so that one definitely came out of things like that. Now, I had never seen the shells until the year 
that the book came out. Now I had emailed the lady um, that had found the shells, Judy, and we had corresponded and she was so excited about the book. And I sent her copies for her and her friends, you know, when it was coming out. But the uh, December after that, I was doing a book signing in a little teeny town in North Carolina called Winton. And she showed up and she brought the shells with her. And so she had seven by that time and they were they were amazing. And they were so much bigger than I thought they would be. The first one she found was like a, um, like a coffee cup saucer. Oh I mean, it's big. Wow. And it was written around the edge. Yes. And um, they look like they were written in Sharpie, just handwritten, nothing really fancy. Um, it was just one of them. You could kind of see where the water had been inside the shell for so long that it was kind of blurred a bit, but really they were so well intact. So it was really interesting. And I've got pictures of those shells. And every time I run across them on my phone, it just oh, touches my heart again. But it was really neat to meet them. And the funny thing was when I wrote that book, you know, I, I knew I was going to have Amanda's point of view, our heroine and, and Paul. But as I got into the story, it was so complex. I felt like I needed some other characters. And so, of course, Maeve, of course, was one of the big ones. But then Tug, the diner owner. He I loved her. Turned out I was my favorite part of the book. Oh, my God. Well, then you are going to love this news. So I loved Tug. And in the beginning, he was just this throwaway character who you know, was getting information and helping me pass some stuff around, right? Well, then I gave him the wife. <laughs> <laughs> the parrot and then he became you know this Why? love and, for Maeve. and so there was the story just grew and I loved him so much and I really hung on to him now the shell collector was never meant to be a series ever that was just I thought it would be a one-time book well the I then of course it gets um optioned with Fox Nation becomes the first Fox original movie which I mean, just, you know, thank you. And, and I, like I said, I didn't write that one on my own. God's hands were all over it. But um, when I watched the movie, Jim Ewens, who played Tug, he brought that character to life. I mean, did your heart not just tug right out of your chest when he said he loved Maeve and she, you know, oh my gosh. I mean, I'll cry every time I think about it. So after that, to the guy who played Tug and I had been sending messages because they didn't get to see the movie. It didn't come out in Canada, which is where he lives, um, for about seven months. So he and I were sending notes back and I was sending him pictures and things like that. And the kids that were in the movie too, their parents. And um, I thought, you know what? Tug needs to find love. So the book that I just turned in- it's called to light the way forward and tug is going to get his happy ending he is going to meet somebody wonderful and i and we are going to see um the sweet wedding between amanda and paul and the kids so i mean i think oh my gosh i cannot wait for y'all to get that book it will not be out until next year <laughs> no, I, that we it at the end. I was like i need the message now theme i need more <laughs> I need to know what's happening, you know, because well, yeah, I, I agree. So unfortunate what happened with me, but yes. I do agree that Tyler could need to find adventure, have his own kind of life, not just the wife, you know, right. but <laughs> book and just everything. I mean, I shared this book with, Carmen, with a couple oh. of my friends because they have experienced grief. Or yes. some kind of loss, whether the loved one or cancer or even children. Or, or even divorce. That a lot. Of and that a lot. Cry, everything. Yes. But this book is just plain, outright, beautiful. That's yes. why I read it again for the fourth time. I'm like, oh, I remember this part. I'm like, why didn't the part really happen? You know, keep reading. Yes. Oh, thank you so much. That means so much to me because I tell you, I mean, going through that kind of grief and, you know, and I lost a brother. So I've seen my parents, you know, carry that grief for 18 years now. And it's still just as hard for them now as it was then. But going through that myself, I mean, I just feel like we all have to go through it. And as women, we always want to help each other, but there's never anything good you can say because grief is never the same. But I hope that women that read this book, when they're going through that grief, 
that there's something in the back of their mind is going to give them just that extra little piece of hope or nugget of faith to just be able to take that step and get out of bed and make the next decision and, and move forward. So that, so you sharing it is the biggest, best gift you could ever give to me. So thank you. <laughs> there was a point when Maeve had a doctor's appointment and at the end, she, she knew that her time was coming. So I stuck it in the page. <laughs> and there was one show that she found and it said, it said, say goodbye to the past because it's time to move on. So that kind of like pinpoint a lot of perspectives in the book, like with Paul, with yes. Amanda, and yes. with me. Like Amanda was so angry with Paul for what he did. But both of them had no idea that who cares? There was nothing we could do. There was nothing we could control of. Move on. And, well, and in that, that in that grief, to, you're trying to need to move on. Yes, yes, and all that grief just ends up getting placed everywhere, and and a lot of times in inappropriate places, right? So yeah, I mean it is, yeah, it's it, it was a crazy tough book to write, but I'm so glad that I had I the can. chance to, and I am forever grateful to Fox Nation for turning it into a movie. I just I am so thankful that they did that. I need um, to like, figure out how to see that movie. I was trying to find it on Amazon because you never know, hit or miss with movies. I was, uh, yeah. was not on there, but dreamy station. So I have to figure out how I could get that. You know, I, want and I'm not get it. I want to see what you're talking about. You're going to love it. You will love it. And when you see Tug in, in person like that, you're going to be like, oh my gosh, yes, she has to write that story, which you already thought. So it's okay. But uh, yeah, I hope so. I hope they hire him to play the part and that they pick up this movie too. But yeah, it's it, very exciting. Um, really. Yeah, that would neat. be really nice to have that similar character from one movie to another. Because I'm going, I, sometimes they have like a, you know, I don't know, five or six movies. We've had the same character for three or four, and then the back, the fifth one, completely different. Yeah. Six, like the old one and the new one. So, like, mm. And it's it's hard it's for like me. The first four. And is it hard for you to kind of let go of who the people were in the other characters that they played? I'm always like, oh, that's not the right person. <laughs> right, but I'm reading, every time I read a book, I try to like visualize who in the character, who in playing the character. And if it becomes a movie, I want him, I want her, I want that kid. So I'm like, oh, when it's coming up, my friends are like, wow, you are very I did too, vaccine in the book. And possibly when, the movie. Or when I see the movie, I'm like, no, oh, he should not play that character. He should play that character. That character needs to be him. So they're like, well, so I do that too. So Kat, when, as I'm like figuring out the plot and the story and as I'm writing, I have pictures of everybody on my board of, you know, what they look like. And I usually have a family tree because, you know, I'm Southern. I can't just make it a sister and a brother. It's always a second cousin or something, you know. And uh, so I always have to keep track of that. But like for Maeve, in on my storyboard, it was Jane Seymour, you know, the long hair and the flowing skirts. And so very different from what was casted. Um, and it was still lovely, but it, it's sometimes hard for me to get my arms around it. But, um, you know, the, the audio book for that is really pretty too. So it's in audio and print and digital and movie. And I'm like, okay, we got everything cornered. <laughs> my so anyway, the whole reason for you to come on today for a particular amount of time was you to talk about the project of how you feel and how you work with the movie network, home market all. Hey, we want to buy your book. We want your book into a movie. So it was really nice to learn and experience the project for you. And I'm really glad that you were able to go to the location of the movie based on the book. I mean, so interesting. probably where or does that often happen with the authors if they connect with Hallmark to be able to go to 
the movie that in you know i i think well during you know sand dollar cove was filmed during covid and the secret ingredient was when covid was just getting started and so neither yeah. one of us did i go on set and that did change for yeah. a lot of them going forward it sounds like it really just depends on who the producers are and what the budget is on whether they invite the author or not but they uh they don't have the they they ask the screenwriters not to talk to the authors um, when they're creating the book or the movie. And I'm sure that I'm sure that is probably a really smart thing to do because we know our story and it's very special to us and it would be hard for them to do what they need to do because screen is very different. I mean, it's a whole different talent and everything that <clears throat> we're trying to and show. I chunk yeah. it off. Yeah, yes. I get that. But I do think sometimes they should just ask us so in Hope of Christmas, if you've read the book, well, in the in the book, it's two single parents. In the movie, it's just one single parent and the other guy's just single. And, um, but in the book, B um, is kind of looking for that person to take over her store. And she's, you know, an older woman and we know she's going to pass. Well, they told me right up front, we're not going to let B die in the movie. It's a Christmas book. We're just not going to do it. I was like, okay, that's fine. But what they didn't mention was that they ended the story with um, with B going off with the mayor and they're going to go on a cruise. Well, in the book, the mayor is married and shopping for presents for his wife. And I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I wanted to- It would have been nice if they'd have mentioned I could have uh, saved them from that. <laughs> who knows? It's going to be a combo. The little spicy lifetime movie of you came and saved time like that. Right. Oh, my so God. Let her die, lifetime, let her that would be a great <laughs> one. No. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just wanted to say thank you for coming on. And I cannot mm -hmm. wait for the second book, or the third book, or how many books did for this amazing book. I'm going to finish it up soon, so... I wanted to appreciate your time and I wanted to appreciate your love of writing Christmas book and similar to Hallmark movies and other books like what was that? Um, what I would do, right? That new book, it was just you only do the last one. And then there was you? This one? Oh, yeah. you talked about I'm so oh, sorry about the title, yeah. That was really good. There's a Christmas book following this. There's a new Christmas book. It comes out October 8th and it's called Christmas in Chestnut Ridge. So anybody who's read this book, you're going to want to come back and get Christmas in, Christmas in Chestnut Ridge. If not, go to the mountains with me in this story. I think you'll love it. And when you asked if there were pieces of me, this little town, Chestnut Ridge, is a play off of where I used to live in Patrick Springs. And um, the No Business Mountain that was right behind my house, the community of super people that I lived with, a lot of that is right in this book, the fairy stones that you can find in the mountains there. So that's coming out October 8th. And then my uh, next release is May 14th. It's called The Law of Attraction. And it's uh, a divorce attorney. Uh, and a an artist who does murals on sides of buildings and stuff. It's a kind of really fun, uplifting story. I think people are going to find it a real delightful bee tree. So that's, that's what I got. Yeah, I was definitely look forward to the book and looking at your social media for any releases. I'll be like, grabbing the book, grabbing the book. <laughs> for most time, I'm going to be looking forward to that and the next. And then I, and I will figure out from where I am now trying to find out how I can watch that movie. Maybe I can ask a couple of my friends, how can I dream this movie? I don't care yeah. if I have to pay or so download you know, anything. Well, and they have um, they have free subscriptions for first responders. If you know any firemen or any you know, policemen, stuff like that. Um, or they okay. usually have a two-week okay. trial. I've that you can check I've it out. That. But there's hey. a lot yeah. of really beautiful stuff on that channel too. Discovery type things with, you know, nature and things like that. So check it out and stay in touch. And I will come back anytime. You just let me know. <laughs> oh, come on. Well, thank you for your time today. I'm happy to meet you and talk book with you. So thank oh. you. Have a great <laughs> evening. Thank you. Mwah. Appreciate Bye. all y'all.
Thank you. Bye. <laughs>